all right everybody welcome back thank you guys for tuning back into uh my channel uh we have the wonderful rodman pc on instagram here uh to have a nice conversation with him ask him some questions about the hobby his experiences uh and some of his thoughts on some what i find are some interesting topics uh that aren't discussed enough in the hobby so rodman appreciate you for uh for tuning in and and you know gracing us with your presence <laughs> You're so kind. Uh, thank you for telling me wonderful. Uh, you're so nice. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's our second time going at it, right? Uh, yeah, we, pretty, we did do a live. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we did a, a lot of that live. I, I had a lot of fun uh, just going back and forth with you talking about uh, soccer cards. Uh, and uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So 100%, man, 100%. Um, I guess just to give people like a little bit of backstory, uh, you were saying earlier, you've been in the hobby for like pretty much 10 years now. Uh, and then, I mean, yeah. I, I guess you can probably go into a little more detail about how you started, what you got into, what cards you got into and what you're moving into now. Yeah, I've been, um, uh, I've been in this hobby for close to 10 years. Uh, I remember, uh, peaking interest in around late 2012. Uh, but it was 2013 when I really, really decided uh, to uh, get get more more into it. I started doing more research, starting to learn more about the about collecting about cards, uh, especially since it had been like close to 15 years since I had been previously active uh, collecting. So the landscape was different. So. But yeah, it was 2013. Uh, um, like you said, I'm Rodman uh, Martinez. My IG is Rodman PC. Um, I collect MJ. That's what started me into cards. Uh, 90s cards ha has been my passion. Uh, I obviously in 10 years a lot a lot can happen. I've been, I can tell you in, in my experience, uh, I was once uh, a well known Kevin Love collector. Uh, <laughs> That was fun. Uh, I did that for like a year or so. Uh, then he got traded to Cleveland, and and everything changed. Uh, for some reason, I'm a I'm a fan of the Timberwolves. Um, and uh, yeah, then I mostly focused uh, on MJ for most part of my collecting days. And I would say the past probably year and a half, I've been focusing on on the soccer market. Uh, Messi Messi has been the the main main uh, uh, I would say focus, uh, but then again, there, there's a lot of uh, good other players I've been I've been picking up. For example, I I, I own a couple of Ronaldo's. Uh, I own uh, a lot of Lewandowski cards as well. Uh, since he joined Barcelona, and I'm a huge Barcelona fan, so I've been I've been picking up a lot of his stuff. Uh, right now, mostly Bayern stuff because the, there aren't any Barcelona uh, jersey cards, but. Um, yeah that's that's what's been my focus and uh you know soccer um we've been we've been sharing a lot of time uh around this market uh, especially in the the messy group and all that so uh i think we have uh, a growing community that's really important uh, to acknowledge that uh, soccer still feels like uh still feel it feels niche uh, i know it has huge potential if if you just look at uh, what the sport means uh, around the world, probably the collector base is not that big, but uh, yeah, just just the popularity of the sport, I think, makes it uh, very interesting. Could we could go? I mean, um, go like big, like basketball, like all these other sports have done in the past. Uh, uh, I know basketball is is big in Asia. Uh, that's really important. Uh, just 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 think of football or soccer in a way. It, it's bigger than basketball. I mean, you have it's the number one sport in the world. So you can you can go by that and maybe just try and use your imagination where we we could be or as a market. Uh, or as just a, a community in let's say five ten years I think the future is bright yeah that's that's a really interesting point and I know it's a point I've I've definitely you know you hear you hear from a bunch of different people with the thoughts of the soccer market in the future which is really exciting if you 
if you believe that's the case, which I know a lot of people do. Um, yeah. and we'll definitely, we'll definitely touch on some of that, uh, very soon. And I, I think that's I actually did not know that about the Kevin Love, uh, PC. That's kind of, that's kind of funny. Did not expect that whatsoever. I know the, the, those years were the dark years. Uh, <laughs> I was, to be honest, I was, I was kind of lost. I mean, it's not that it, it's anything, uh, good or bad. I mean, regarding to Kevin Love, I mean, I, it's just, it's just a, a phase in which um, I was probably trying to find my lane. I mean, I, I, I had been picking up a lot of MJ cards for a while. Those got expensive. So I was like, just trying to figure different different uh, uh, ways to just get fun out, out of this hobby. And, and Kevin Love just was someone that was, uh, I was watching like every game. I was watching every game of the Timberwolves. They were actually playing really well. Kevin Love was had crazy stats uh, in that season. I think it was twenty between twenty thirteen and twenty fifteen. He had like this these couple of years where where he was he was uh, it was an all star. He was uh, uh, racking up just really good numbers. And um, I just started and like you know me, I usually go deep when I start something. So I started chasing all the one ones, all the logo mans uh and i managed to uh build a really really cool kind of love collection but i eventually came back to my roots had to sell uh actually held and i still own a, a a huge part of that uh collection but i i i moved most of the big stuff and i put that towards mj uh and i'm happy happy i did that oh, sure <laughs> i'm sure you are um yeah, so kind of what kind of one of the main topics, uh, you know, we kind of discussed and what we want to touch on in this interview, whatever you want to call it, um, is from the period where you started cards into where it is now. I think we've seen, I, you definitely agree, a lot of consolidation in terms of companies, uh, in terms of whether that be shops, whether that be eBay auction houses, uh, anything along those lines. Even even fanatics buying up card, uh, you know just uh tops and whatnot potentially panini um i guess i guess we'll, i'll start a very broad and we can niche down as we as we go mm -hmm. forward in the conversation i mean what what does all that mean to you and do you see it as a positive or negative uh for the hobby's future well pretty loaded. yeah a pretty loaded question but uh i'll try and uh and try and uh keep my keep keep it uh keep yeah, it sure. short um i mean there's so many angles you can take uh your question from i mean if if you look what what's happened just with the with the um, with the market uh a lot of big companies a lot of big money has come into into collecting uh you've seen the evolution of not only hobby shops but auction houses as well uh, you might be surprised, but probably Golden a couple of years ago uh, weren't wasn't considered uh, a, a big auction house, at least for cards. I know they they've been around for a while, but uh, you could actually come away with steals on in on Golden because uh, at least the the that picture of big auction houses uh, being relevant in the space it was it was totally different back then you'd had like just one big channel, which was eBay and just di different, different collecting uh, forums. And uh, that was it. And you would only see um, a lot of memorabilia being sold by these auction houses. And probably they, they didn't have a big focus on, on cards. You had PWCC, which they were big, but they were, they were in eBay. So you, you didn't, you didn't have this, uh, um, market in which for example as you see it now you have pwcc which it's a big auction house they, they've now uh, gotten into memorabilia as well and now you have golden uh which is which they're huge they they put a lot of money they do a lot of um advertising for their auctions and uh they actually got a huge investment by this uh investment firm of really known people like kevin durant and all these guys guy in a way would let legitimize 
uh, our industry. Uh, you have tops being acquired. You have this huge investment group uh, coming in and acquiring different companies and uh, merging and just being doing these like Fnatic did, did with 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 tops. Now I, now I don't know. I we heard a couple months ago about Tenini probably being um, bought by tops. So. I don't, I don't know. My take on that is just it, it legitimizes uh, cards as uh, something uh, which probably a couple of years was just uh, something you would do and you, I mean, by yourself in your basement and wouldn't even share it, share with it with your family members. Uh, I know a lot of people were like that back then because uh, it wasn't, it wasn't that uh, well known around now you can you can actually uh you, you see the the interest in people once you you let them know that you're, you're in the space that you're actual a collector and good thing about this type of hobby is that if if you if you're into this on a long term you're you're you'll probably make good money out of all of this uh collecting it's like if you compare this to different hobbies, like we were talking in 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 Dallas, it's like if you like collect cars or just I don't know. Imagine you like to play golf. I mean, it doesn't it won't it won't make, it won't bring value to to what you're putting your money and time and effort to. Which cards have definitely turned into into an asset class in a way because uh, they hold value. They've been around for I would say over a hundred years now, so you could you could easily consider it a, a an asset class or an active. Uh, I mean, a, a, a legit asset class. Um, so I don't know. I just rambled all over the place, but uh, in a way, I, I just think all this all this we've been through is a good thing. Most people probably hate that one company controls too much. But in a way, Panini has been doing it, and I think they've they've been loved and hate in different stages. But uh, I think they've done actually a good job, especially not not having MJ or LeBron carry products overall. I think that's huge. For sure, not in, in the products. Yeah. For sure. So overall, overall, probably like a net positive for the hobby. Obviously, you know, can always. I, I guess I'm paraphrasing for you. Can't always, you know, rel uh, control everything. Not everyone's perfect, but as a positive, legitimizes it more. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's definitely a valid point, and I do agree with a lot of those points. I'll play a little uh, devil's advocate, as I as I like to do. Um, and so, obviously, you know, we've seen, like, the consolidation, and you kind of touched upon it, the fact that there's a lot more, a lot more so, like, power into specific – niches or like like for instance fanatics is going to control like pretty majority of the cards produced psa is going to control the majority of the cards graded control pop reports control realistically realistic a lot of that stuff if they want to make it something do you feel like that takes I'll, you know i'll use like psa for an example I, I know a lot of people that have complained about certain grades that they get. I mean, I that they've gotten on, they feel like they've been graded unfairly. For instance, like the messy mega cracks, for instance, the 71 biz. I know multiple people have mentioned they're like, yeah, back when they were submitting these, we we're all getting like sevens, eights. Now we're submitting these beautiful cards and they're coming back and they are, you know, they're getting destroyed on grade. Um, probably you know a lot of people have the theory that certain cards they want to keep the pop relatively low especially in terms of cards that are you know they're kind of scarce because of the condition grade um does does something like that with so much power being put into one company does that kind of almost take away from the free market per se that is cards Yeah, it's a tough question because, um, but in a way, it's like if, if you, the things you've mentioned, 
to be honest, those issues are not new. I mean, if you go back five, 10 years ago, uh, the grading subjectivity has always been an issue because uh, at the end of the day, they're, these cars are being graded by humans and uh, they can make mistakes. I'm pretty sure uh, this is an issue across the board with grading companies, which you get a card that could get undergraded or ju you just get cards that are just, just enough. I appeal, you can tell they're, they were probably uh, overgraded in a way. They don't deserve the actual grade they have on. But uh, I, I saw a post, a post recently, uh, someone someone did a, a, a shot, of, I think it was six 52 mantles, uh, all with different grades. They all had different issues with centering. They all had different issues with corners where, with even the color on the card. And uh, at the end, the one that had the best eye appeal was one of the lowest. So I know that 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 brings a lot of questions to the to the grading companies. I think that's a, an issue that has to be addressed in a way. And I think uh, the answer to that should be technology. I mean, these companies have to eventually re resort to some type of technology just to bring bring that average uh error of the of, of, or human error down in a way it'll never be perfect but it, if you're if you're if you're in this you should know that you you can't go just by the by the by the grade you, you gotta inspect the card you gotta use your your better judgment as well the, don't just go just because you see it, it, it it's in a psa 10 because it could be an old psa 10 or it could be a old bgs 10 or it could be one of the other grading companies. Uh, things can happen. These cards get handled, they get shipped, they get dropped. Uh, I mean, so many things could happen. Um, it's kind of like uh, uh, cliche, but just buy the card, not the grade. I mean, you, those are one of the, like the hobby phrases that get tossed around all the time, but it makes sense and in a way and, and i think that that's the best advice you can give someone just entering the space uh by the card not the grade and i don't think this issue is, is like i was trying to say is not cost because just psa is trying to just be bigger than or, or bigger than they can actually handle or any of the other companies not not trying to be specific about a, a company or the other uh, one of the tasks of, of, of each company is, is trying to scale up and, and be consistent about grades. And I would assume that that's, that's the hardest part to actually um, control when, you, when you're trying to scale up. But let me tell you, I, this is not new. So I don't think it's, it's actually an issue about scaling or, or what's been happening in the space. For sure. For sure. Um... I guess I, I, I'd use that as an example, I guess. But so let me let me kind of dive into like a little bit of a different point with that. So you said buy the card, not the grade. Obviously, there's a lot of new money that kind of recently came into the hobby. But to them, what would you I know I have my thoughts. What would you say is the more like the factor that they really decide to buy? Like, are they going to buy? as like, let's just say like a, I don't know, a investment fund or something like that, that they want to add some to their portfolio. Are they going to buy a Jordan PSA nine that looks like it's a 10 in the slab? Or are they going to look up, buy a beat up PSA 10 Fleer? I think there's only one answer. Well, I don't know. It, it depends where you're coming from. I mean, if you're just looking at something from an investment point of view, you would probably be, be, be better holding the higher grade if you're in between, okay, I want to semi invest or feel like I'm investing, but in a way I'm also collecting, um, you could, you could also just settle for a lesser grade. I mean, it all, it all, all depends on, on your means to spend and not exactly what's the reason behind actually looking to buy. I mean, if, if you, if you look collectibles as as investments, uh, yeah, they all have potential appreciation on 
some on short term, some some on long term. But uh, just depends uh, where you're coming from. Uh, that's I mean that's the best investment I could make. It's, it's like uh, I mean advice I could make. I mean just just keep it keep it more more as as a a collector than an investor and i think you'll you'll be safe uh, on the long run for sure yeah. so you, i would say you, you obviously definitely have cards that you would obviously you're a collector but you also have cards as an investment per se so what do you identify like what do you identify in a card to make it worthwhile for you to consider it like a solid investment piece it's got to be hard to find to me that's one of the main reasons if it's a card i can i can easily find on eBay. It's not interesting to me. I, I want the cards that are not not hitting the auction block, the cards that you don't you don't see listed all all the time on eBay. Just um those cards that you see on collectors' hands that you can go and inquire about them and just they'll let you know they're not for sale. Th those that you can even bring a huge offer private offer and see that not even a good offer would let them let them sell or or let go so in a way i think that's a big factor especially uh for me it's not all i buy i mean i got some cards right here like uh this messy this is a mundi chromo card psa 10 it's probably not rare I just like the card, uh, so it's not all the all my purchases are not are not based off of that, but I do need some core cards in my my collection to be like special, and that kind of like gives it its own identity in a way. And around it, I can have like smaller pieces just just to bring in more volume and. Uh, at the end, I'm I'm also buying, like I said, cards. I just think that look nice, uh, and uh, it's not always about value or rarity. It's just uh, something I think complements what uh what my collection is at that particular moment. It's uh, it's kind of like hard to describe, but you're like building something over time. And you feel like each piece you're adding complements the other. Uh, like you saw in Dallas, I started like shiny and rare. And then I was like pretty happy with what I built. And I was like, all right, what do I need? Uh, then I started focusing on, on autos. And our first slide was one of like the catalyst of, off of that, of what, what I eventually came to, to acquire. Because I remember you asked me, uh, like, what, 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 what did I think were like his top cards, and uh, what, what, which were his best autos as well, and I kind of like knew in the back of my mind, but I hadn't like tried to rank them in a way. So, but, but when I did, I was like, all right, I, I really know which are like the key autos of his. So I was like, okay, I, I gotta get a work, and eventually. <laughs> I'm only missing one, uh, which which I mentioned in that video. So, so yeah, I think that I think my mindset as a collector comes first. Now that I'm comfortable knowing what I want, the investment in me, I mean, the investor in me comes in and says, "Okay." this is rational or irrational to spend. But most of the times, like I said, the collector in me wins eventually in that debate. And I mostly end up paying more than I should, but I just, just happy that I eventually acquire what I chase and just, just see what happens with the market over, I mean, on a long long run, like I said, I'm not in it in this on a short term. So I'm I'm always thinking five, 10 years from now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I thought that was actually really funny because I remember that. And I remember seeing us talking about a specific card. 
And then in the messy group chat, like a day or two later, you're like, yeah, I just bought this card from PWCC <laughs> just straight up. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. That was quick. Um, so I thought that was funny, but to go, to go with that earlier point. So, I mean, obviously I want to touch on that investor side, for instance, cause like, obviously I don't think we're, you spend quite a bit of money on cards and I mean, obviously they're great to collect, but you, you know, you want to relatively have some value increase over time. Um, and what you said exactly, you're looking for really rare, really scarce cards that you hardly see, super tough to find. Um, so by by having by considering that an investment, what do you consider more so? What do you look for more as like a driving force to increase the value of that investment over time? Do you look at more so of general growth of the hobby or investment slash institutional money coming in? Cause I think that's two or a mix of both. Cause I think that's two very uh, different things. Um, I just, I mean, they go in a way side by side. I mean, the institutional part of it has just been just thrown out so, so much over the last two years, which in a way that, I mean, I think institutional money, uh, I don't know how to explain my train of thought right now, but it's like, it usually uh, focuses more on, on the profit side of everything. It's like, okay, an investment has, has to eventually bring in some type of profit Uh, with with collecting. It's, it's similar, but it's different because this type of asset class is, is not liquid. I mean, it's illiquid. Um, it does gain value. It's not regulated, which could be could be complicated. Uh, Good or bad, depending uh, how you look at it. <laughs> of course, of course. If 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 the money is coming in, of course, it's great because you, you'll you'll see a lot of people spending money like crazy and not knowing what they're doing. If you're smart, you can take advantage of that. A lot of a lot of of old collectors have obviously taken advantage of that. Um, so. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I just keep coming back to, to, I mean, if, if, if I would prefer a, a market where just investment uh, money comes in, uh, I don't think uh, on the long term, this will eventually be a healthy market because they will always chase uh, profit. And what, what's the backbone of this market? is and will always be collectors because they're investors as well and they're they're the ones holding cards long term even if they're worth double what they pay an investor as soon as they reach x value they will eventually sell off because their main reason in the market is not collecting it's just making profit so what what's happening right now market is down that will probably clean the market of a lot of people who are just who are just playing and not really looking to collect. So, as a collector and slash investor, I'll always welcome more collectors than investors, because that's in a way will will mean it will be in a healthier market. We won't see those crazy gains like we've saw in the past, and. I would just be happy buying cheaper cards. For sure. I, for sure. You can't go wrong with that. It's definitely a collector's down market. It's definitely a collector's market for sure. Um, My thing is. So like five, 10 years down the line, like whenever you do decide to move on from your cards, like who do you envision being the, the end consumer? That's mm-hmm. I, that's like kind of more so who how I how I should probably have phrased that question, like who do you envision uh, who do you envision being that end consumer? Assuming that your cards really went up significant in value, it's a tough question. Great question, but I think this market, like every market, goes through cycles, especially in collectibles. They say you have uh, some type of refresh or reconnect. Or reconnection with with uh with a hobby each each 20 years 
Um, I don't remember where I, where I heard this concept, but it makes sense. It's like uh, probably the kid that collects today, that eight-year-old, that nine-year-old, that wishes that would they would have more income to buy parts at this local at, at the at the current prices price levels. We'll probably have buying power in twenty years, and if for some reason in their in their life they eventually come back to collecting like I did, like other other people have come back. 10, 15 years later, 20 years later, we will be in a much better economic uh, and buying power position that we were when we were kids. And if they're really passionate about it, they will try and chase the cars that they wish they could would have bought uh, when they were a kid. So that's why you see a lot of brands uh, like retroing or coming back in fashion every 20 years, like you see, you see Reebok coming back. You see all these brands that were big in the 80s, the 90s. They're just coming back because the, the there's a market for for nostalgia, first of all. And uh, collecting cards is, is nostalgia driven. So I think uh, that, that would kind of like explain in a way uh, that 10 year old that loves Messi, it's been watching him, that 13 year old, 12 year old that has been watching Messi for the past, I don't know, eight years, uh, they could come back uh, and they'll, they'll probably have the means to acquire these cards. And hopefully, I don't know, the market has sustained uh, in let's say 15, 20 years. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely, to me, that's like the big question is, I, I definitely do agree. It's like, it's gotta be, you know, in order for the hobby to continue to keep growing and, you know, stay relevant per se, it's gotta be the next generation has to be involved and has to, uh, you know, take part essentially. You can't just, the, the, I mean, I guess that leads to a whole different question. I don't know if they say they want to go down that route per se, but what if, what if those kids are more interested in the NFTs and the digital stuff <laughs> and all that? I don't know if I, I don't know if we want to go down too far in that route, but it makes you it makes you kind of question that if you want to if you want if that's your uh your thesis per se. Yeah, I think I think there's a possibility things will be different twenty years from now. Uh, but same could could be said about those tobacco tobacco cards in the early nineties. Uh, everything's different today, and they're still they're still collectible. There's still a lot of people chasing them uh, for whatever reason they are, uh, and they've stand the 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 time. I mean, and I just think uh, cards are here to stay, man. I don't think they're there's they're just it's not like they were they started two years ago. I mean, just a lot a lot of the current market or the current collectors just realized actually two years ago, but. This thing is much bigger than that. Uh, it's been around for more than a hundred years, so I don't think it would be an issue with 15, 20 years from now. It'll keep growing. Fair, very fair. Okay, yeah. So another thing I uh, like to speak about is like obviously, you know, for for more or less like soccer along with other sports, I mean like they've been collected per se, but they really haven't been like nearly as mainstream as they have been over the past definitely two years per se. Like, again, I think, obviously, I think we're both a little biased with soccer because that's kind of what we primarily, you know, the the realm we play oh, in right. and we know the community. But I guess as a whole, if you want to call them fad sports outside of like the big three, do you consider, do you, do you see those like continuing to, even a down market when people leave, do you consider them to like have a significant place in the hobby whether that be like Star Wars cards, celebrity cards, stuff like that, or do you think they're going to slowly die out due to the lack of collectors? With soccer? Uh, I would just say soccer is one, but I let's just say all that stuff as a whole, if you had an opinion. I mean, regarding to soccer, I think uh, we're in a way we're, we're just – 
uh, mentioning the sport, but we're forgetting forgetting eventually why we collect. We collect mostly because of these stars, these players that mean something to us, which uh, have in a way marked uh, a generation. They have marked the sport uh, like Cristiano did, like Ronaldo did. Uh, I mean, like Messi and Cristiano did. Um, and in a way that what moves us is that passion for the for those players, for those iconic players. Uh, I could, if you could uh, reference other sports, uh, you had what happened in the 90s, what MJ did as a sport had a uh, correlation to the, to the card market in a way. This obviously he's a, he's a big star. Uh, he had a lot of fans and a lot of people will, were gravitated towards collecting anything MJ from sneakers to posters, just, uh, clothes, jerseys, you know, all the realm of collectibles around these figures. So I think in a way, soccer um, has the equivalent of, you know, we always reference back to, to MJ or like, who's the MJ of soccer and all that. So in a certain way with cards, I think, we will all always reference back to okay, who who's the Messi of, of let's say five ten years from from now when Messi is retired when Ronaldo's re retired. Well, we will always be referencing back and having uh, different iterations of who's who's the who's the equivalent of of in this let's say just uh, Ronaldo and Messi. So I just think. Uh, the car market eventually will evolve. You have guys like Mbappe, Haaland, which right now feels feels more like prospecting, just like it would feel like a Luca or uh, a Trey or any of these young kids that are coming out. So in a way, I think the soccer mar market will mature. We're, we will eventually go through these phases in which a lot of people will put money into prospects. They won't pan out. They will lose money. But you will have a couple of hits. You will have these guys that come out and eventually build a career and build uh, a fan base and collectors will follow and et cetera. So like I said, I think collecting always goes through cycles. Uh, the sport overall obviously will, will, will have a, a, an impact on what happens in the, in the card space. But uh, in the way I see it, EPL keeps growing. Uh, the sport gets bigger. More eyes will be on it. You have the World Cup in 2026 will be uh, here in America. So I think that will be huge. A lot of people that uh, will pro probably haven't watched the World Cup. This will be the first one. And the other one, well, they will, they will know what they're looking at and learn to appreciate it more. So I think soccer is is safe because of that. Uh, now with different markets like like I don't know Harry Potter cards or stuff like that, in a way it feels different for us that we collect sports. But if, if there's passion there, markets will eventually will eventually hold. Uh, at obviously everything at a different pace. Uh, but I don't know. I just I just feel there's always space for collecting. Sometimes we might find it odd or weird, but there's people that once were fighting over um more of these like uh oh what you I forgot the they were like uh fluffies or something like that. I don't know if you remember, I forgot the name. Beanie babies? Yeah, those yeah, the beanie babies and those apparently were worth a lot of money. That's what I've heard. Seems crazy, but uh, I mean, there's always there's always a market for everything, and uh, uh, I mean, I don't think they will eventually disappear. I mean, they'll, they'll probably just won't won't have uh, the notoriety that some markets get. Like we've turned like social media into like we love to broadcast like uh, if something happens big on Marvel and like they started, they start like pushing that market and something, I, I don't know. 
Like, yeah. I know I know a lot of people have to try to push like VHS. I don't I don't see it to be honest, but apparently people are spending a lot of money on that. Um uh, whoever whoever is spending money on that, I mean, kudos to them. It's their thing. Uh our thing is our cards. Uh some other collectors of other things might feel the same way about us, but uh, those that are in it actually get it. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the future holds. Uh, we'll see. If we stick around, we'll see. Um, but regarding to soccer, I, I feel totally fine. Uh, looking yeah. forward. I would, I would definitely agree with soccer. More so, like, the question for me is, like, how many of those people getting into, like, Marvel PMGs or the Harry Potter, whatever it is, are they just in it strictly to make money? As you were saying, like, are they investor heavy rather than like, is there actually like a collector base like soccer based off the people I know, I would say there definitely is a strong collector base, probably stronger than most sports at like in terms like percentage to like strictly flippers. But I would say I would say stuff like that, the actual true collectors base has to be pretty darn small just from an outsider looking in. Which is the concerning part to me. Yeah. I think we went, like I said, we went to, through these phases, like felt like, uh, I don't know if you remember, Le Meme had a famous uh, meme about which the, the death is like knocking on doors and he would, he would like uh, put like random pump markets that occurred on each door and it was like, okay, right, what's next? So kind of like felt that way for too long. I think I don't I don't think they left any how do you say that uh, unturned stones. <laughs> it's like they they took care of everything and those people probably left. I mean I don't I don't think there's there's uh, we're gonna see more more of that. Uh, but um, I don't know. I just I just feel. The collectors eventually will will be the ones there along all these uh, promotion in the market. Uh, those will withstand the time and uh, yeah, let's we'll see what happens. I definitely agree. I think throughout all this, the collector will win out in the end, stand the test of time, hundred um, percent. Final thing before we kind of end off here. Top five messy cards out there. I, you know, I had to hit you with this because I. <laughs> oh, we kind of we kind of brought so, it in last time. I want to see what your thoughts are now. It could be anything. Well, let's exclude like super fractors and one on one blacks, uh, but just like top five messy cards in existence besides like the 2017 super fractors, and then like the prism. 2014 101 black and all that stuff like all, overall yeah, like, yeah. So ex exclude super could be autos patches i mean anything yes it could be autos patches whatever yeah. you have to put me on the spot uh, i had to man i had to this is a tough question um do they have to be in any, any particular order um I'll hear, I'll hear, we'll hear what you got. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. I'll give you a number one. I think the number one messy card has to be the spotlight auto. Wow. Okay. I think I that, has, that has to be his best card. Uh, his second best, I would say 2014 Prism Gold. Just because the relevance of 2014 like started the whole modern uh soccer era so i think that will ever will that card will will ever be king uh i would say number three 2017 tops chrome red refractor uh number four would have to be oh my god this is so hard this is so hard because uh, I'm, I'm right now I'm, I'm debating between shiny and rare or maybe another auto of his. Uh, but if we just go by rarity and importance, 
uh, in my just my obviously opinion, I would put 2016 Select Gold as his fourth best card. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, and fifth, I would I would say his uh, his 2016 Flawless. Uh, either the flawless finishers or the momentous, which is his rare, rarest patch auto. I think it's out of five. Wow. So the 71 biz is not in the top. That's crazy. I've got a couple, I got a couple of reactions of that. 71 biz <laughs> not in the top five list. Controversial to say the least. <laughs> and then I asked you this in Dallas and you had a doubt. You definitely gave me a different answer than that one. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> depends how many drinks i had <laughs> yeah maybe that's crazy wow i mean yeah it's definitely it's definitely a tough i, I definitely put you on the spot with that one though for a fact. Oh, you, you definitely caught me off guard uh to be honest <laughs> um i've i've always told you in a way uh, it's hard top five or, or top ten will eventually keep evolving um it's it's not easy uh it, I'll probably put more 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 thought into that and I'll see if I can reconsider. But that just came out of uh, yeah left field uh, that way. Let's see let's see how it pans out and well, with time. Well, let me ask you let me ask you this one question because I I don't believe I don't know if you have one in a lower grade that you just don't bring the shows. But do you do you even own a seventy one biz? No, I don't. Why is that? Why is it? There's just too many of them. Okay. Just feels like just feels like the '86 player, man. It's uh, Jordan, the Jordan uh, base. It's just like uh, it feels so 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 similar to to MJ because uh, you have like all these rare cards in the modern era that remind me like the golden era, golden years of of of, of basketball cards, which was from 96 till 99 like they had this crazy span of years where which they produced like really unique quality cards and just really rare parallels um and that kind of like feels in the same way like modern soccer and uh if you ask a lot of the mj collectors they will always choose those rare really rare cards over his rookie cards just because it's so overproduced and uh, easy to attain. Will it hold a place in a, a relevant place and in, in in his reign or realm or range of, of cards? Of course, it's his rookie card. But uh, I don't know. I just just love rare, rare, rare stuff. It's like uh, I think uh, that kind of like keeps me from picking that card interesting that's how i feel yeah. that's very interesting that your take on that because i i feel like from certain people that i've talked to that's very opposite which i i totally hear your reasoning and i guess only time will really tell which is going to be more revered but uh it's definitely an interesting argument to have um yeah just just remember those five cards i i, I told you about see how many times they, they hit the market or how easily you can attain them they're impossible to get. I was I was actually expecting at least a couple of those that I mentioned to hit the this World Cup auction that's going taking place on Golden. Yeah. Just because I think it's the first auction just for soccer cards or for soccer items, and you have the World Cup coming in and. You didn't you didn't see any collector letting go of those cards and sending them to auction, which I think it's big, because if some if someone was looking to cash out, that would have been the perfect opportunity, and none of those cards are are that are listed on that auction, so I think that means something in a way. So let me ask you this: you th What are your thoughts about that auction, by the way? Because there, that stuff it's is that. crazy. Stuff. I haven't. It's a scroll fest. I mean, I haven't had time to just. Uh, I just filtered uh, Messi. I filtered Messi, Holland, 
Ronaldo, Mbappe, Lewy, and just a couple other players. Pedri, Gavi. And I haven't had time to just like go through all of it, all of that. But just Messi has like 300, more than 300 lots. I think Messi is one of the, the, the one that has more cards in that auction. Uh, there are a couple of nice cards there. Uh, but um, like I said, uh, the, the, the ones I mentioned are not there. For sure. And haven't been auctioned. Like I've never seen a 2016 uh select gold in the past year and a half doesn't come up doesn't come up and the guys holding them are not looking to sell so it kind of gives you an idea of how important it is i think we've seen more 2014 golds than any of the other of the other cards in that top five yeah i think you're right I feel like once that first one sells, that's the thing. I feel like you see a couple come out of the woodwork. Like we saw that gold power matchups come, and then we had the uh, the true gold sell right after it. And you kind of saw, I think, another one popped up. Uh, the true gold sold back to back. One was a nine. Then you had the PSA 10. And then you had, like you said, prior to that, you had the, the power gold, which is, I think, the same one that's coming up in this auction. You the so, messy, the messy, yeah. Yeah, the messy, yeah. Someone, someone just has to, I don't know, I feel like that one person took the initiative to set the price or set a benchmark, and then a couple people are flooding in after that. So yeah. that might be part of it. But with that being said, I mean, I think I think it's definitely valid. The true stuff that's really collectible and people really want aren't just hitting up auction like that. That's a very valid point. Um, With that, guys, I think we're going to, end it here uh rodman really do appreciate you uh taking the time out and uh having a chat with us uh hope we all you know had some compelling gave us gave you guys something to think about uh, a little compelling conversation uh and we will so yeah appreciate you rodman thank uh, you for having me thank you for having me. yeah uh we have uh, one uh after the World Cup, and we'll see what what we got what, to. You right. got a big, you got a big bet on, or not? I mean, not huge bet, but it's a decent sized bet with my with uh Frank Argentina v France. Who makes it farther? Yeah, and Kunku's out now too. Well, they just keep get, getting injured. I just uh, shame uh, was reading today another player got injured. So <laughs> it ain't looking too hot these days. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but yeah. Appreciate you guys all for watching and tuning in. Uh, you know, we'll be back again next week with another interview. Um, but yeah, appreciate you all. Have a good one.